Good morning, testing, testing. Welcome to Adult Ed on this second Sunday of Advent. We are glad that you are here. Folks at home, let us know if you can hear us in the Facebook chat. Good morning, good morning. If anybody is out there watching online, we very much invite you to participate in this conversation. And I will be monitoring the comments on the Facebook live stream, so that's where you can share your thoughts. Um, and welcome to those who are here in the chapel. Good morning, good morning. We do have a handout here for those in person, and for those of you following along online, I will be uh, posting some links in the chat on Facebook. So I think we're good. Now, before, uh, so, welcome everybody to our Adult Ed series on this second Sunday of Advent. <laughs> so just, that proves I am monitoring the comments on Facebook. So please do chime in if you're watching at home, but now I've got the volume off. So welcome everyone. Uh, this is week two of our Advent series here in the Perspectives class, and this is a series exploring art for Advent. Last week, we did some sort of introductory stuff and talked, looked at a couple of pieces of art that helped us explore the idea that Advent is focused on the coming of Christ in the past and the present and the future. And if you missed that class, it is available to watch online at the church website or Facebook page. And today, we are going to be looking at some art that helps us reflect on John the Baptist. Uh, but before we get into that, we have an important logistical announcement. Next week, Sunday school is going to be an hour earlier at 9 a.m. Because there is one combined worship service next week because of the cantata. So there will be adult ed, but it is an hour earlier at 9 a.m. So we do hope to see you next Sunday at 9, either here in the chapel or online. All right, so to get us started this morning, I thought I would share a brief uh, excerpt from an Advent devotional that was posted online just yesterday. And this was written by um, a young United Methodist preacher from Maryland named Ryan Wiggins. And this spoke to me, and I thought it connected with some of the themes we talked about last week. So let's read this as our um, opening meditation here. For those of us for whom the early nightfall quickly gets old, or who are exhausted by the dim prospects that we see in our world's futures, Advent offers us a kindred spirit this is the season for those who struggle to remain hopeful. It's a season for dogged resistance, for naming the evil of the world as it is, and stubbornly insisting that its victory is not our fate. If there were ever a time to embrace our fears and anxieties, Advent is that time. And we are able to do this because we sit within a Christmas story that speaks a better word about who we are and what the world is. In the apocalyptic language of our scripture readings and hymnody, we are reminded that we do not live in the world that God intends for us. We live in the space between the first and second advents, where promises are true even as they are unseen. A space where death and decay still rule, where our sins against one another and against the world entrusted to us have not yet been visibly redeemed in Christ. We are reminded that even as we know the Spirit of God is among us, still we wait for thy, thy appearing, chasing all our fears and cheering every poor benighted heart and in the midst of all of that of all of this our only choice is to sing as wesley did guide us into thy perfect peace amen that is our prayer for advent guide us into thy perfect peace and so the pieces of artwork that we looked at last week um explored a bit of that theme of what it means to be in this time of 
anticipating Christ's coming, beginning in the dark with acknowledgement of all the ways that we don't see that fulfilled, but yet holding on to that hope and that longing. So today, we are going to look at a couple of pieces of art that explore the theme of John the Baptist. Now, on the second Sunday of Advent, in the lectionary every year, we get a reading about John the Baptist. Here in our church, we sometimes follow the lectionary in our worship, but not always. So I don't think we're going to hear John the Baptist uh, read or preached in worship today. But many years we do, and many churches that follow the lectionary hear a reading about John the Baptist on this second Sunday of Advent. And so, KG, if we could get our first uh, image up on the screen to uh, have here as we are reading this scripture passage. We are going to look at a scripture from Matthew chapter 3. Is there somebody who would be willing to read for us really loudly? Chris, thank you. Uh, Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 through 11. Matthew chapter 3. In those, day, in those days, John the Baptist came, preaching in the desert of Judea, and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the desert, Prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. John's clothes were made of camel's hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea, and the whole region of the Jordan, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not, think of, do not think you can save yourselves. We have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up, raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance. But after me will come one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not fit to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Through 11? Uh, read through 12. Okay. His Sorry. winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Thank you, Chris. Well, that does not sound like a scripture passage you're likely to find on a Christmas card. This depiction of John the Baptist, this one happens to be by El Greco from about 1600. That's not likely an image that we would see on a Christmas card. So here's my question, and I would love to hear from those of you here in the chapel and from those of you at home on Facebook. Why is this scripture passage a text that we read during Advent? Why does the lectionary give us this text on the second Sunday of Advent? about the coming of the Lord? Yeah, what, what do you see in this text about the coming of the Lord? What he's saying, yeah, he's coming. Be, be, be ready, beware. Be ready, get, yeah. Get prepared. Get prepared. What does John the Baptist say getting ready looks like? Repenting. Repenting. Is, like, visibly, though. Visibly, though. Mm. As opposed to what? I don't know, like saying you're repenting. Ah, but actually doing it. Mm -hmm. Actually like changing your way of life, mm -hmm. which is what repenting really means. Mm -hmm. What else catches your attention in this passage that you think connects to Advent? Yeah, Sally. Everything about John the Baptist was very down to earth, very natural, nothing fancy about yeah. him at all. And then our Christ was born in a manger, surrounded by animals, nothing fancy about that Ooh. either, very down to earth. The first ones that heard about it were shepherds who were dirty and disgusting. Yeah. That's our Jesus. Yeah, mm, interesting. 
interesting. Yeah, nothing fancy about this figure. In fact, he's pretty wild, right? Is there anything in this El Greco image that, that you see here that the text reflects? Are those clouds? That's a great question. I think they are. What do you notice about the clouds? There's almost kind of a brooding sense, isn't there? Maybe cross like it's, the what's that? The cross in the background. Ooh, the cross, yeah, that I think is actually in John's hand. I know it's kind of hard to see the image from, from far away. But yeah, there's, John is holding a, a cross on a, long, on a long stick or a long pole. Can you notice any details about the cross? I know it's kind of hard to see. It might be made of wood. I don't know. I can't really tell. Yeah, it's not fancy, is it? <laughs> like Sally said, it might be made of wood, some natural material. It's interesting that the painting is done, you know, it makes me think about Michelangelo's like real attention to the anatomy of the body. And he's, you know, clearly someone who doesn't. The, the, to me, he's clearly eating something like locusts and honey. He's not <laughs> someone who's overindulging, and yeah. you know, he's very sinewy, and um, you know, so a lot of miles walking, and not a lot of times lounging around eating. And you know, he just strikes you as someone who's really out there living yeah. sparingly. Oh, that's such an interesting observation. That even his physical appearance, there's so much attention to detail, and and he looks rough. He looks like somebody who really is in the wilderness, subsisting on locusts. Yeah. Is, is that a lamb beside him? It sure is. It's hard to distinguish. Yeah. You can certainly feel free to come over to this side if that's easier to see. But that's a great, great thing to notice. That lamb by his feet. What do you make of that? A reference to Jesus, the Lamb of God. Yeah. Yeah, isn't that interesting? The, the clouds didn't look like angels to me. I was thinking the same thing. Yeah. Ooh. I thought they looked like astronauts. I keep thinking they're not, but then I keep thinking they are. That's yeah, cool. interesting. Sally says the clouds kind of evoke angels to her. And angels are messengers of God, right? Sometimes in iconography, John the Baptist is actually portrayed with wings. And of course, John the Baptist himself is not an angel. He's just a person. But there is a sort of tradition of very stylized iconography that uses those wings to depict the fact that he's God's messenger. What did you say? I thought I saw an astronaut, so. <laughs> a little anachronistic, but. I wanted to see if this was a fork, like the winnowing fork, but it's just a, it's... it's what, while you're up there, what's the really, like, sort of bright white thing? Yeah, some there? sort of that? banner? Yeah. The lamb, is the lamb dead? Sally asks, is the lamb dead? <laughs> it's, it's holding the stick that has the banner on it. And it's holding the stick that has the banner on it. <laughs> now that's intriguing, right? So it's probably not dead. How, how, it, how is a, a dead creature holding a, a banner? I can't read, I can't read. That's intriguing, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, and does in fact point us to something about Jesus, right? Who is the Lamb of God who died? Who is also the King who is victorious even in death? All right, we've got some comments online here. Someone says, he was beyond natural and not fancy, but from the wilderness, a place of danger maybe, at least the margins of society. He surely didn't fit in. Yeah, absolutely. Um, another comment here says, he was direct, maybe even rude, in calling out the religious hypocrites. Phew, 
yet in the painting, I think he doesn't look angry. So yeah, we certainly saw in this text, his preaching does not pull any punches, right? He's got some very harsh words. Yeah, there, there is sort of this, this part that focuses our attention, almost like a halo. Yeah. Almost sort of evokes the story of Jesus' baptism when the heavens are parted. You can't tell if he looks forlorn. Ooh. Chris says, I can't tell if he looks forlorn. And this, yeah, Eve. Just to the, um, I guess I have two things. One, to the left of his knee, because I'm looking at it um, closely, it looks like um, a head. And I just think that's something, it's actually it's kind of a platter, it's kind of a foreshadowing of this kind of a platter. Ooh. The second thing I'd say is that when you hear a speech like this or look at something like that, right, we call the authorities or we call somebody and we kind of write them off, wouldn't we? Yeah. Eve says if we heard a speech like this, we'd either write him off or we'd call the authorities. And that is exactly what happens to John if you read a little further in the story. He was in fact beheaded by King Herod with his head presented on a platter. And so that's another image that we often see in depictions of John the Baptist. Well... There are a lot of different um, artistic representations of John the Baptist. He is a very common figure who has been painted in lots of different styles, in lots of different eras. And we're actually going to watch a short video now. Um, this is from a really cool resource that I commend to you. The National Gallery in London has put together a 10-part series exploring the art of John the Baptist that is in the National Gallery. And all 10 parts are available on YouTube. I will put a link in the chat on Facebook. And I actually also put the link um, on that sheet that I passed out on that handout. There's a, a link and the name um, on, on the top of your handout there. And that would be a cool resource that you can use um, throughout the Advent season here. But this is a series called John the Baptist from Birth to Beheading. <laughs> And we're going to watch uh, the introductory video here that gives us a little overview of some of the John the Baptist art in the National Gallery and some of the themes in the ways that he's presented in paintings. And I can hardly believe it, but we've been teaching this collaborative MA between the National Gallery and King's College London now for four years, and focusing specifically on Christianity and the arts, but in particular on the figure of John the Baptist. And I've really enjoyed exploring the National Gallery's collection, and I think at, at my last count I'm at over 120 figures of John the Baptist, so it just shows his popularity across centuries and in different geographic locations. And he's a hugely important figure in, in Christian tradition too because uh, he's the one who arrives to, uh, to proclaim the coming of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. He is the forerunner, as he describes himself, preparing the way of the Lord. And in that sense, um, he's one of the very first saints and one of the very first figures who appears in the New Testament. The, the Christian Bible is 
divided into the Old Testament or Hebrew Bible, which it inherited from Judaism, and the New Testament, which begins to tell the story of Christ, and the life of Christ particularly concentrated in the four Gospels within the New Testament. And John the Baptist is one of the very first characters to appear in the Gospel narratives, um, precisely because he's the forerunner. And yet, he also looks back to that tradition of prophets in the Old Testament. And in that way, he sort of represents um, both continuity and change, doesn't he? And I think that's captured very beautifully in Carlo Crivelli's um, 15th century altarpiece that we're looking at. If you have a look at here, John the Baptist is represented on the left. And what I'm struck by in particular is that the way that he stands on one particular ground, which, as you see, is at the banks of a river, and how that marks a disruption between the other saints of the same altarpiece who stand on these very elaborate marble parapets. So he's both part of this gathering of saints and set apart. He always stands out, it seems to me, as quite unlike any other saint, so distinctive. I mean, you can see any number of bishop saints and you have to work quite hard to work out which it is, or monk saints, or the saints of virgin martyrs. Um, the Baptist you could never mistake for anyone other than himself. And I think that's something that um, artists have picked up on. They wanted representations of their saints to be immediately recognizable, not least perhaps from the back of a church, mm. from the congregation who couldn't get up close. But actually, if we do get up close and have a little look at this altarpiece, I can show you a few of the details. The Baptist, because of all the time he spent in the desert, he's often represented as quite thin and emaciated with long, wavy hair. But possibly the most recognizable attribute is he wears this extraordinary camel skin, which he is said to have clothed himself in. Um, but there's a few other attributes that we have in the Crivelli that literally point our way forward to different aspects of his life, namely that pointing gesture, which you'll see repeated over and over in representations of John. It's the perfect symbol for his whole preparatory ministry. He is a pointer. Um, he's pointing to Christ. That's his job as a saint. And here it's wonderfully achieved by the fact that he's pointing to words that refer to Christ on his scroll, the Latin words ecce annius dei, which mean behold the Lamb of God. The Lamb of God was John's description of Christ, the one who would die to take away the sins of the world. And those are really important words for, for Christians through the centuries too, because they're uttered in the context of the Mass or the Eucharist. It's as if some of the Baptist's most important words are immortalized in the regular worship of, of Christians at the point where the bread and wine are consecrated and represent the congregation. Of course, John often carries a reed cross um, in allusion to Christ's crucifixion, but the fact that it's made from reeds refers back to his time by the River Jordan. That's where John the Baptist did his baptizing. And this representation of the water in the foreground of this panel represents that very river. And interestingly, Crivelli's included this little riverbank on our side, on the viewer side of the painting, so that he's situating us on the banks of the River Jordan, facing John. That's wonderful. It really brings us into the picture, not only into the presence of John, but into the idea of baptism itself, as, a, as if we could step into the water and be baptized by him ourselves. Mm, almost an invitation. And most often, John is represented in the act of baptizing Christ. And we're very lucky at the National Gallery because we have one of the most famous representations of that baptism by Piero della Francesca. I'll show it to you. The Piero della Francesca baptism was painted about just over 20 years before the Crivelli. Mm -hmm. And it was also an altarpiece for a church in Piero's native city, called Borgo San Sepolcro in Tuscany. And it must have been for an altar dedicated to John the Baptist to have this as such a prominent feature at the center of the altarpiece. And you see, even from here, look how it sort of pulls you towards it. Here in Piero's baptism altarpiece, we see probably the most represented scene in the life of John the Baptist. When we don't have him represented singly, as we did in the Carlo Crivelli altarpiece, this would be the key moment. This is the culminating moment, if you will, of John's life, isn't it? He's been baptizing others until this point, but at this point Christ arrives to receive John's baptism, and that's both the crowning point of John the Baptist's career, why we call him John the Baptist, Precisely. and also the beginning of Christ's public ministry. And it's quite interesting, too, this is the moment where actually 
Christ is the central figure. He, his ministry begins, he becomes more and more important, and John's lesser so, but always, I mean, as we will see in every moment, John is always that step ahead. He's preparing the way for Christ. That's fascinating, because he is, he's a preparer and a precursor at every point. He's just one step ahead, as you say, of Christ. Mm -hmm. In terms of the first to have a miraculous birth, the first uh, to preach, the first to baptize. Uniquely, apart from Christ, we have his whole life told within the New Testament from beginning to end, and not even the Virgin Mary has that privilege. It's perhaps why he's been such an important focus for artists and patrons who represent every scene, every episode from his life. And what we'll do in the next nine episodes is actually examine National Gallery pictures which represent key moments from his life from beginning to end and maybe explore why he was so important for so many different people over the centuries. introduction to this series um, and like I said there are 10 parts in this series and if you go to that website that's either in the Facebook chat or at the top of your handout you can watch the rest of them and it goes through depictions of John the Baptist in all the sort of key events of his life but we did get an answer to one of the questions that was raised here somebody asked about the the cross that he's holding and they pointed out that traditionally, John the Baptist is depicted with a cross made of reeds that remind us of the river where he baptized. So that's intriguing. I was also really struck by what they said about the, the perspective that some of these artists use in how the, the river is almost sort of there and we are invited to step into it. Um, What does that idea of being invited to step into the river evoke? Well, it moves you beyond being a passive observer of, of the painting or whatever. Mm -hmm. that you're invited to engage in some way, whether it be in a physical sense or in a spiritual, emotional sense. Yeah, it moves you beyond being a passive observer. You're invited to engage. we're invited to imagine ourselves among those who are being baptized by John, those who are heeding the call to repent. Baptism being a, a sign of repentance, being an initiation into this new way of life. An invitation to a beginning by Presbyterian uh, uh, quibbles with uh, rebaptizing <laughs> it's also an invitation to a rebeginning, to a fresh start. Yeah. And in Jesus, there is always the hope of a fresh start. Yes. A new beginning. In Jesus, there is always the hope of a fresh start and a new beginning. Thank you, Jack. And that is why every year we have this season of Advent, because every year we need to be reminded that we have things to repent of that we are invited to, to bear good fruit, as John the Baptist says. Well, let's take a look now. We're going to watch one other segment from this series. I would love to show all 10, but we don't have that kind of time. So this is um, a, the part in the video that focuses on John the Baptist's preaching. And KG, if you can press play on that. What says the voice? We'd start this episode, which focuses on the preaching of John, with our beautiful little Raphael Padella panel, which he painted in about 1505. And I'm always struck here by the fact that even though John is raised up on this natural mound, almost like a pulpit, um, the attention seems to be more on the, the gathering of the figures 
coming to listen to him. Yes, maybe we even sort of see ourselves, or are encouraged to see ourselves in them, and, and, and it's helping us to think what it is to be a congregation, to listen to preaching. When I look at this, I always think of a, the famous early English um, composer Orlando Gibbons' setting of that early part of John's story, where he's preaching and all of Jerusalem and Judea come to hear him. It's called This is the Record of John. And one of the things that he sets is the, the, the line that John uh, preaches to the people, prepare the way of the Lord. He's summoning them to prepare themselves and some seem more ready to be prepared than others. And that's actually a very serious message and quite a stern one and you can almost imagine that reflected in that very kind of composed but almost stern looking face, saint. Yes. Yeah. There's something there, and then I'm sort of my eye is led around the painting to think about the different kinds of attention that people are giving to this very important message. This figure leaning on his chin seems to be very focused He's wrapped, isn't and he? attent, mm. whereas this sort of more portly figure yes. <laughs> is slightly distracted and looking away. Absolutely, he carries the world in his belly. And as other things to think about, like his dinner. <laughs> yes, exactly. But also the kind of sweet inclusion of these little children who seem to sort of be pulling at their father's leg. Very sweet. And I'm fascinated by them because, again, part of the content of the Baptist preaching is this line that the Lord can raise up children of Abraham, even from the stones, which is perhaps, I wonder, being illustrated here by the fact they're sitting on a rock and they're in a state of sort of innocence, aren't they? They're, they're naked. And I have seen other images of the Baptist preaching where you often see a small infant. Um, so perhaps it's a reference by Raphael or by the patron, a direct reference to some, this little detail in the Gospel. Well, this painting seems to focus a little bit more on the congregation and their response, let's say, to John's message. We have another painting here in the National Gallery of the same subject by an artist called Mola. And there it's quite interesting, the focus seems to be on the message instead, and so there's a slight nuance change. So perhaps we ought to look at that picture next. This painting's by an artist called Pier Francesca Mola, and it dates to about 1640. And as you'll see, it's the same subject as the Raphael little predella panel that we just looked at. But I wanted to show it to you because the focus seems to be quite different in this canvas. If you remember what we talked about in the Raphael, we talked about the, the congregation being the focus, the attention. Yeah, they've um, shrunk here to just a few representative figures. Exactly. And John is centre stage. He is. He's, he's highlighted, quite literally highlighted. And if you look very closely, you can see that his mouth is open. He's very actively preaching in this Always struck me as one of the challenges of showing in a visual image the, the act of preaching which is an auditory experience and, and what what as well, visual tricks can you use to suggest a moment of, of speech yes. but the, the open mouth is obviously one and and the gesticulating finger captures in a physical movement something of what preaching is all about preaching is directing it's it directing is direct one's mind isn't it and directing specifically christian preaching is directing towards the figure of Christ. And again, a familiar passage from the Gospels comes to mind here. John says, there's one who comes after me who is greater than I am, and who was before me, which is a peculiar way of putting it. It's quite convoluted in yeah. the Gospel passage, but actually you can imagine someone like Mola picking that up and saying, how am, how am I going to make that convoluted passage into something very legible? And in fact, it is here, and you'll see that the, um, the reed cross and that pointing gesture of the Baptist just so clearly direct our gaze back to the figure of Jesus. It is like a Jesus. massive arrow. It is. Actually, that gesture itself becomes a sort of an attribute of the Baptist. If you, you start looking at images of the Baptist, that, that it's always that pointing gesture that's part of the message. That's very true. Along with the other things we've already spotted, his camel skin, his reed cross, his banderole, the hand itself and the Bumble pointing hand. stands in for the whole message. Yeah. And actually, the National Gallery has a beautiful altarpiece by Parmigianino, which might have the most dramatic example of that pointing finger. I think we should look at that painting next. It's nearby, isn't it? Ben, this is the Parmigianino altarpiece that I was telling you about, with this extraordinary figure of John the Baptist. And that preternaturally long finger. Actually, it might be better to look at the altarpiece from here, because it really suits a bit of distance given its scale. The finger reminds me, again, that preaching is a sort of pointing, but a non-literal pointing. 
And actually, that makes sense for, for this painting, for this altarpiece, because it's actually a non-narrative altarpiece as well. Is it non-literal? Non-literal scene. <laughs> yes, because you would never get this combination of characters all together. John appears almost preaching, but also in the wilderness, together with another penitential saint who we often see in the wilderness, the sleeping Saint Jerome in this case, and of course the virgin and child, the child to whom he points so emphatically. And it's not just that emphatic pointing gesture that strikes you. I mean, the, the face of John the Baptist in this is so engaging, almost that piercing gaze. And that gaze combined with this very complicated, twisting pose. Absolutely. Isn't that extraordinary? Yeah, his legs face us, but his body then turns all the way around and backwards. And it reminds me that one of the images used by early Christian commentators of the Baptist was that he was um, a fibula, which is the, the Latin word for a brooch. And I think it's because the brooch is hinged in a certain way. And as we've noted before, the Baptist is like a hinge between the old and the new order of things, the last prophet, the first saint. And here his body expresses that sort of sense of being a hinge. It, you know, it, it's like it pivoting. It yes. pivots um, and directs us further up and further into the painting. And the gaze initially arrests us, but says, don't stop with me. Start with me, but don't stop mm. with me. Go further. Mm. Um, it's uh, like a co he becomes a sort of conduit for our own gaze. And that is the message of the preaching. He is preaching and directing our view up towards this extraordinary Christ child who actually, particularly from this distance, you see he's stepping out towards us, that hovering foot. Yeah. So as the Baptist moves back, Christ, <laughs> the Christ moves child forward. moves forward, he's Absolutely. making way as it were. Yeah, I'm struck by the leopard skin that, that he has instead of his familiar camel. Yes, it's sort of draped over his thigh. It's, it reminds me of the Roman god Bacchus who's often depicted with leopard skin and there's something a bit Bacchic isn't there about John? Yes, actually in, in a few iconographic traditions he seems to appropriate or acquire Bacchus's attributes and sometimes even wears a crown of um, vines in his hair. And there's something about associating those two kinds of wildernesses, mm. the wildness. Yeah, they're outside of the Bacchus. norms of the city and they just dis both disrupt convention. Yeah, so it's destabilize sort of, things a bit. Precisely. So he's sort of absorbed and taken on some of those characteristics of the yeah. of the the Roman god. But um, isn't that extraordinary the way there's also, if you make out just in the in the left hand side, in of the, all of these amazing skins that he's wearing. Can you see the, there's a cup uh, attached yes, to his on belt? His, on his hip. <laughs> yes. Exactly. And that's, that t tells us what all of this preparing the way ultimately is for. He's preparing the way of the Lord, but for a very specific purpose, which is the baptism. The baptism, exactly. Um, and actually that will be the subject of our next episode. Once again, we see in these paintings this invitation not just to be a passive observer, but to get drawn in to the message of John. And we saw in some of these pieces, as our, our scholars pointed out to us, this focus on the different possible responses to John's preaching. That we saw depictions of the crowd where some people do respond to that call to repent wholeheartedly, and others are too invested in otherworldly things, too distracted, too focused on their own needs and own pleasures. And I think that does once again raise this question for us of how do we respond to this call to repent? Who in that crowd are we like? We also saw the imagery that is quite common in these paintings of John of the finger, sometimes even the exaggerated finger, pointing to Christ, of the focus not being on John himself, but of John preparing the way and drawing our attention to the one who comes after him. And then they said this really interesting thing, I thought, when they were noting about how John's body seemed almost twisted, that he is often depicted as a hinge figure, even physically showing that he is a hinge between the old and the new order of things. A hinge between the old and the new order of things. Yeah, Sally. So when Mary visited Elizabeth, Elizabeth was pregnant with John. Mm-hmm, yeah. yep. So they're actually only maybe six months apart-ish. Yeah, 
Yeah. So it seems to me, I think about John's upbringing, that he was brought up hearing about Cousin Mary and the baby who's going to be the Christ, and then he ends up being a preacher preparing the way for his cousin. I, yeah. That part's fascinating. Yeah, it, it sure is. And even in that story of the visitation of Mary and Elizabeth when they're both pregnant, Mary pregnant with Jesus and Elizabeth pregnant with John, it almost seems like the babies recognized each other, even in the wounds. So yeah, yeah, that is fascinating. Stephanie, I want to come back to um, him, the turning thing again. Yeah. Because before they were talking about him being a pivot between the old and the new order, I was thinking about it as repentance, that Ooh. he's turning away from you know, the outer world and turning toward Christ. And, so, just a thought. Yeah, thank you for that, Emily. If, if, that, if the mic didn't pick that up, she said the, the image of the turning figure, in addition to representing being a hinge between the old and the new order, that it also evokes an idea of repentance, of turning from one way of life to another. Yeah, that's a great observation. Thank you. Did anything else catch your attention in those paintings? Well, Sally, there is a whole episode in this series on the visitation and depictions of that, if you want to go look that up later. But in our last 10 minutes here, I want to look at this uh, more contemporary piece of art. And this, is, I'm going to put the link here in the Facebook chat for those at home. And this is a piece of art called John the Baptist. And the artist is Caiaphas Nuxamalo, who is South African. And this piece is a lino cut from approximately 1970. Um, and KG, if we could get the camera on that um, image on the screen, I'm gonna read a brief reflection on this piece and then I would love to hear some of your thoughts because there's a lot going on here. Caiaphas Nuxamalo was a printmaker and wood sculptor who studied at the Rourke's Drift Art School from around 1968 to 1971. He was associated with the African-initiated AMA Nazaretha Church in South Africa. In this linoleum cut, Nuxamalo shows John the Baptist, the forerunner of Jesus, preaching repentance, bottom, baptizing, and eating wild honey. The eye of God, which sees secret sins, burns bright and glorious. I'm not sure whether the people at the bottom are running away from John's message of wrath or turning around from their wickedness to follow the true way. In Matthew's account, there are people from both categories of response. The triangular frame rising from the baseline was a common compositional device Nuxamalo used to tell multiple components of a story. And in this context, it's especially appropriate, as it seems to me, to allude to the valleys being lifted and the mountains being brought down low, a leveling of the landscape so that God's glory can be plainly seen from any vantage point. On another level, this prophecy of Isaiah probably also refers to the proud being overthrown and the humble being exalted, as Mary sings about in her Magnificat. Advent is about the coming consummation of the kingdom of God in the day of the Lord. In Advent, the once and future coming of Jesus Christ, Fleming Rutledge, who calls on the church to restore Advent's focus on apocalyptic theology, describes John the Baptist as the central figure of Advent. She half jokes that behind one of those cute little Advent calendar windows should be a coarse, fiery John shouting, you brood of vipers. Quote, irreducibly strange, gaunt and unruly, lonely and refractory, utterly out of sync with his age or our age or any age. 
John the Baptist arrives announcing the opening event of the end time, end quote. As prophesied by Malachi at the end of the Old Testament and confirmed by Jesus in Matthew 11, John the Baptist is the new Elijah standing on the edge of the universe at the dawn of a new world, the turn of the ages. That is his location as the sentinel, the premier personage of this incomparable Advent season, the season of the coming of our once and future Messiah. End quote. Like John, the church, Rutledge says, is also located on the frontier of the new age, between Jesus' first and second advents. And we, too, are called to herald the Messiah, announcing, Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. And that's a reflection that comes from a blog called Art and Theology, and I posted a link to that uh, reflection in the chat on Facebook. So we have about five minutes left, and I would love to hear what else you notice in this painting, or what that commenter said that really resonated with you or didn't resonate with you. You don't get it? Yeah, it's, it's strange, isn't it? It's kind of bewildering. Which is Jesus? Is Jesus in this image? People are getting baptized. People are getting baptized, that yeah. Yeah, that's happening in the upper left-hand section. So as the commenter said, this artist often uses this kind of triangular spacing to show multiple events in the same frame. And so in the upper left, uh, we have people getting baptized. Is that Jesus? Is that another person? We don't know for sure. Which actually, I think, reminds us of something interesting, that Jesus was baptized in just the same way as everyone else was. I remember a few years ago, Allison preached a sermon about Jesus standing in line just like everyone else, um, and what that shows about his solidarity with us. So we've got baptizing in the upper left. We've got John eating wild honey in the upper right. And then in the bottom, um, the, uh, this commentator described it as uh, the all-seeing eye of God. The eye of God which sees secret sins burns bright and glorious. I'm not sure whether the people at the bottom are running away from John's message of wrath or turning around from their wickedness to follow the true way. In Matthew's account, there are people from both categories of response. Well, regardless of which of the two, those two responses, what's clear is that there's a lot of uh, emotion, yeah. uh, astonishment, uh, a strong reaction on the part of those people. Expressions on their faces and the hands lifted up and all that. Um, this isn't a group of you know, the frozen chairs that are sitting in a yeah. boring Sunday morning. Yeah, I think. <laughs> Lately, our sermons have not been boring yeah. at all. Yeah. But uh, there have been a few priests over the years. And, uh, you know, these, these folks are pretty uh, amazed. Preaching has a big impact on right. Yeah, thanks for that, John. He says we really, or Jack, he says that we see that, that this preaching really evoked a strong response of astonishment. I'm really struck by the hands of the, the lower figure that are not like blessing or here, but they're lifting this sort of line that's depicting, it is dividing that lower third from the upper. And I, I just keep imagining what that's supposed, you know, is it that he's lifting and making space in some way for these people to, to have room to make response? Is he, 
uh, my initial reaction was sort of, was this supposed to be hell? And he's lifting, you know, um, lifting them out, of, you know, or something, lifting them out of hell or something. I, I don't, I don't quite know what to make of. And, I, and then the author did mention the, you know, laying low of the valleys and the mountains or whatever, lifting up the, the valleys. So that, you know, obviously could be part of it as well. But I'm just really taken with that to me. There's real emotion and, and strength and determination there, and that lifting thing going on. Yeah. Oh, that's so interesting. All that those arms evoke. Well, like I said, I did put the link to this painting or this lo this lino cut and reflection in the Facebook chat, so you can certainly go and spend some more time with it. But that meditation quoted a bit from a Fleming Rutledge sermon, and that is the handout that I gave you, and I'm going to put a link to that in the chat as well. And that is a sermon that you can take and read about John the Baptist as a figure of Advent. And then also on that sheet is the link to the... Um, National Gallery series. So I would like to close us in prayer with a prayer for the second Sunday of Advent from the Book of Common Prayer. Merciful God, who sent your messengers, the prophets, to preach repentance and prepare the way for our salvation, give us grace to heed their warnings and forsake our sins that we may greet with joy the coming of Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. All right, well, thank you all so much for engaging with this and for sharing your thoughts and your responses. And don't forget, next week, Adult Ed is at 9 a.m., so one hour earlier. And we'll see you next Sunday at 9, either here.